Well, good morning, church. It is good to be back together again. Uh, just thinking uh, this, this series we've been going through in the fall in Romans chapter 8, and it's been entitled The Greatest Chapter. And uh, just thinking about that title and going, uh, some people may have some difficulty with that because, to be honest, the whole Bible is really good. <laughs> so we, we do believe that there are some incredible truths as we look at Romans chapter 8. And uh, one of the things that, that comes to mind is, as we think about going through and uh, things we've been challenged with as we've gone through Romans 8 so far, is to always keep in our mind that, that, that Paul's goal, or one of Paul's goals in writing is not merely to give information, but most of the times when Paul wrote to individuals, he was writing to people he knew, uh, many people he knew, uh, many people who had come to Christ under the ministry of him sharing the gospel. And, and so this, this is, as we, as we read these words, it, it's, they're heartfelt words, they're, they're deep words, they're words of truth, they're words that instruct, um, I think they're words of warning. And, and the reason Paul does it is because he has this relationship, because of his love for the church, because of his love for Jesus Christ. As we continue this morning, we're going to be looking at uh, just one verse. Actually, it's just one sentence, Romans chapter 8 and verse 18. And in this verse, it says this. Paul writes these words. He says, For I consider that the suffering of this present time are not worth comparing with the glory of that is to be revealed to us. Let's pray. Father God, we come before you this morning. We want to thank you um, that even as we've sang, uh, creation, uh, the eagles in the sky, the mountains, uh, what you have made points to you as the creator. God, we thank you for the, the command in your word that says, let everything that has breath praise the Lord, all things. God, we thank you for your word, and we know that it's more than just a book. It's not just merely words on a page, but God, it is living and active. And we pray again that as we, we go to it this morning, that you would, by your spirit and your grace, engage our hearts with the words that are in it. That to be much more than just words. That your spirit would do in us what you've intended to do today. Whatever that may be for us, maybe that's encouragement, whether that's a correction. God, we pray that we would see you in a greater way. And we pray this in your son's name. Amen. We used to play a game at, at youth group. Um, and the game was, would you rather? And, and what I would do is I would give um, the teens that were there Two options, and they had to choose one of the options. There was no sitting on the fence. You couldn't be undecided. You needed to make a choice. And so most of the time, to make sure that their choice was clear, I'd either go, say, go to this side if you want this option, or go to this side if you want this option. And very clearly, you could see where they went. Um, sometimes they were sitting down, and I would say, okay, if you want this option, raise your hand. And it was always interesting when I did it that way. Before anybody raised their hand, they'd be looking around and saying, who else is going to raise their hand? right? There's this perception of what are other people going to be doing. So, for example, some of the things that we would say, and we would start usually pretty light and we get into different topics, but one of the things we would say is, so would you rather drink Coke or Pepsi, right? Or would you rather read a book, which may take four, five, ten hours, or watch it summed up in a movie, which takes two? That was just my interpretation of the question. <clears throat> would you rather go skiing or would you rather go surfing? Now, all of those, all of those things, and, and, and we make choices, and I think we make choices in two ways, but, but all of those, those, those options that I gave you are based on, I think, the first way that we often make choices, and it's simply by preference. So would I rather have a Coke or a Pepsi? That's what it boils down to. What's my preference? Which, which of these two options that are given to me would I prefer to do? The second way I think we make choices is we weigh the alternatives before us and we ask, how will I be impacted by the choice that I choose? Is there pros? Are there cons? 
Is, is one answer right and, and one choice wrong? Are, are there benefits? Are there sacrifices that I need to make? And, and that's another way that we make, we make choices. For example, we do it all the time. We say, um, is, is what I have to give up worth what I will gain in the end? Right? So, um, will I exercise so that I'll be healthy? Is the pain of exercising worth the promise, possibly, of being healthy? Or we say, will I take time and sacrifice my time to practice something with the hope that the gain in the future is that I will excel in that which I am sacrificing my time currently? Two ways in, in, in which we make options and uh, decisions, and we make those decisions all the time. Every day we go through making just decisions and choices. We don't even think about it. We're so programmed to how we make choices. Well, in, in the verse that we're going to be looking at this morning, Paul is going to come to a conclusion on two things. And the comparison that he comes to, the comparison that he makes, is not so much a preference. But what he does is he weighs the options. Is it worth it? Will it pay off in the end? It's as if Paul has one of these gigantic balance scales. You've got a pan on one side, a pan on the other side. You place your things on, you see which is heavier. That's what Paul has here. And in this verse, what Paul does is Paul encourages those in Rome. And I believe that Paul encourages us today by sharing his conclusion of the way in. And he's saying, this would be my recommendation. This is what I would do. And so what we want to do this morning is we want to take some time. We want to look at these two options that Paul is weighing. And I think they're two options that every follower of Jesus Christ has to weigh. Paul had grappled with the question of, is it going to be worth it? He weighed the cost against the gain. So what was the cost? In verse 18 it says, the cost is the sufferings of this present time. We live in a world that knows suffering. Every person who's ever lived has experienced suffering. Either mentally, physically, emotionally. Right now, for some of you, there is suffering in your life. For some, that suffering is really raw and to the surface. For others, it's something that, that is deep. But you know that right now, you're going through a very difficult time. I have gone through and known some pain physically in my life. I've known some emotionally. And I, I would say sometimes that pain when I'm by myself, has broken me. And it's deep. And some of you know that. But at the same time, I would say that the pain that I've experienced in life is minimal to the pain that many people in this world have experienced. As we consider suffering of this present time, I believe that there are two causes to the suffering. The first cause of this suffering is one that affects everyone who lives. This is suffering as a result of sin. Had there been no sin, there'd be no suffering. But because there is sin, there is suffering. Paul knew all too well what it was like to suffer because of the fall. He knew pain. He had people that were close to him, people that he had entrusted, people that he had built into who all of a sudden got up and just abandoned him and left him. He knew the pain of someone turning away from him. Paul also knew physical pain, as we can read about him. He was something, it was something he was all too familiar with. All of mankind suffers in this way as a result of the fall, whether you're a follower of Christ or not. We live 
in a world of pain and suffering. But there's another cause, another cause that those who are followers of Jesus Christ will go through that's included here, I think, in Paul's reference to suffering, and it's the very fact that you're a follower of Jesus Christ. On two levels. Suffering included in dying to yourself. For those who are followers of Jesus Christ, I believe that this is the life battle. We, we, see, we see Paul talking about it in Romans. In Matthew 6 and verse 24, Jesus said this. He says, if anyone would come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross, and follow. To, to follow Jesus means a changed way uh, of thinking. It means giving up things that the world looks at you and go, you're foolish. Why would you want to give that up? It's thinking and taking on the mind of Christ and therefore putting off the mind of the world. I think the suffering of being a follower of Jesus is also seen in persecution. Again, listen to the words of Jesus in Mark 13, 13. And you will be hated by all for my name's sake. But the one who endures to the end will be saved when one follows Jesus, there should be a difference in your life from those who are not following. The one you are seeking to please is not yourself. The one you're seeking to please is Jesus Christ and what he has called you to. Again, Paul knew what it was like to suffer in these ways. In 2 Corinthians 6, verses 4 and 5, Paul wrote this. He says, But as servants of God, we commend ourselves in every way by great endurance, in afflictions, hardships, calamities, beatings, imprisonments, riots, labors, sleepless nights, hunger. You see, like, like Jesus, Paul knew that there would be suffering as a result of following Christ. And I think this suffering, we need to realize, can come in many different forms. It doesn't have to simply be physical. It doesn't have to be being thrown in jail. It doesn't have to be martyred for your faith. I think this persecution can come in the way of the fact that you might lose a job because you decide not to do something because you believe it's unethical. And you take a stand for Christ and go, you know, I can't do that. I know of students who've written papers in school and because of their stand for Christ and what they wrote on the topic that they were given, they received a lesser mark. It may mean not being accepted into a group of friends because of the things that you stand for and they don't want you around. You see, persecution can have many different faces, but when Christians suffer ridicule or are made fun of or mocked, they go through any form of difficulties because of their relationship with Jesus Christ, it's persecution. It's not something that you seek. It's not like you wake up one morning and go, how, how can I be persecuted today? It's you wake up in the morning and you say, today I'm going to live for Jesus. Come what will, it will come. In regards to suffering, Douglas Moo wrote this. These sufferings of this present time are not only those trials that are endured differently because of the confession of Christ, for instance, persecution, but encompass the whole gamut of suffering, including things like illness, bereavement, hunger, and death itself. The word Paul uses here refers to the sufferings in any form and cannot be restricted to the sufferings on Christ's behalf. And like I said, we are familiar with suffering. We know what that's like. And so when Paul refers to sufferings here of this present time, he's, he's probably including both the sufferings of the fall, and we can see that a little bit more in the verses that are following, verses 19 to 23, they show that. But also the sufferings endured as a consequence of being more like Jesus and living for his mission. Like I said, Paul knew what it was like to suffer for Jesus' sake. The question that he, he had come to the conclusion was, to was, is it worth it? He'd asked the question. He'd weighed the pros and cons. He saw what he needed to sacrifice. He saw the gain, and he came up with a conclusion. 
I think like Paul, we need to ask the same question. What do we do? What do we do with, with suffering? Either because of the fall or suffering because of following Jesus. What do we do with that? Do we, do we have an answer for that? In determining whether or not the suffering of this world would be worth, worth it, Paul compares it to the glory that is to be revealed to us. Paul looked to the projected outcome. Again, you have this platform scale on this side here is present sufferings of this current time. This side, the glory to be revealed. But what is that glory that is to be revealed? What are the sufferings weighed against? I've always had a hard time trying to really grasp glory. What is glory? How do you define glory? And what is the glory that is to be revealed to us? And so, so what I want to do is I want to try to, to clarify this word glory for us. But I also want to give us the context in regards to Paul's statement here. Because I believe it's so important for us to know. John Piper writes this. He says, glory is not easy to define. It is like beauty. Beauty. How do you define beauty? Some things we have to point at rather than define. And so as I've thought about glory this past week, this is kind of how I would come up to my definition. Glory is the radiance or the characteristics of any given object. It is the seen, perceived, observed, or experienced character of that object. Glory always shows forth or reveals the attributes of something and what it does. That's glory. Example. Plant. The glory of a plant. Things that are observed. Experience, characteristics. So I'd say the glory of the plant are the form of the plant, the size of the stalk, the color, the leaves, the shape, the type of flower, the fragrance, all of those things that we observe or experience or smell, possibly taste, are all point back to the plant. That is the glory of the plant. So in regards to glory in the Bible, again, John Piper says this. He says, The term glory of God in the Bible generally refers to the visible splendor or moral beauty of God's manifold perfections. It is an attempt, I like this, it is an attempt to put into words what we cannot contain in words. What God is like in his unveiled magnificence and excellence. It can refer to the bright and awesome radiance that breaks forth in the visible manifestations. Or it can refer to the infinite moral character, excellence of God's character. In either case, it signifies a reality of infinite greatness and worth. And so I think for us to understand, what does it mean when Paul says, the glory revealed to us, we need to have a grasp on the definition of glory. What is glory? And we need also to know God's purpose in displaying his glory. As we read through the Bible, what we see is when God created, he created with the purpose of all creation showing forth his glory. We also see that after the fall, God's glory was partially hidden or veiled. And after that happened, what we see is we saw, see God's purpose to redeem, to restore, to make his glory shown as it was intended to see, be seen. A, a quick run through the Bible. Genesis 1.26. God said, let us make man in our image. After our likeness. God sought to display his glory in man. God's aim was that man would so act that he would mirror forth the character of God. 
Man was given the exalted status of an image bearer so that he would reflect the glory of his maker. God's purpose in creation was to fill the earth with his glory. And so in the same way that the moon reflects the light of the sun, it reflects something that is not its own, so creation, so mankind was to reflect, to bear, to show, to shine the glory of God. But when man sinned, he wanted to make a name for himself. He wanted to focus on his own glory. Contrary to God's purpose, and as a result, the glory of God in a major way was hidden or veiled. And after sins, things were no longer the way that God had originally intended them to be. And God's purpose in history has been to restore man to this rightful purpose so that the glory seen in man would again point to the source of where it came from. In fact, as you read through the Old Testament, what we see is we see God, God creating or aiming to create a people who would recognize his glory and delight in him above all things. Over and over again, God says, for my name's sake, this I do it. And God promises, as we read the Old Testament, that he will do it through a Savior. And the Savior is Jesus Christ. Jesus, the Son of God, did what man was created to do before he sinned. In John 17 and verse 4, Jesus prayed this at the end of his life. I have glorified you on earth, having accomplished the work that you gave me to do. In Hebrews 1 and verse 3, it says, The sun reflects the glory of God and bears the very stamp of his nature. Jesus did perfectly what we had been created to do, to show the glory of God. Jesus' all-consuming desire, his purpose, his life, his mission, was to glorify the Father. Again, John Piper writes this, he says, to be willing as the Son of God to suffer the loss of so much glory himself in order to repair the injury done to God's glory by our sin showed an infinitely valuable, how infinitely valuable the glory of God is. To be sure, the death of Christ also showed God's love for us, but we are not at the center. God's glory is. You see, Jesus' death, resurrection, happened so that God would redeem people so they could do what they were created to do. To redeem, to buy back, to purchase. Jesus' saving work is the act of buying sinners out of the bondage to sin and out of bondage to Satan with the payment of the ransom of his life. Paul says that the glory that is to be revealed will come. And what he's referring to is a time that will transpire when Jesus returns. And as I've thought about this, this, this definition of glory, and as I've thought about this, this concept of, of the story or the, the line of God's glory being revealed, I think for some of that we're going, okay, that's a little too much. Why do I need to know that? Why, why is that practical? How is that practical in my life? But I really believe that if we don't see the beauty and the splendor and the awesomeness and the, the amazingness of, of what God has done, we're not going to be able to weigh the suffering of this present time. Paul says the glory that is to be revealed, he's referring to that time when Jesus will come. The glory that was veiled in part will be, be seen. Things will be restored to the way they should be. And even though the Bible doesn't spell out exactly what that glory is going to be like, we know that it's going to be absolutely amazing. 
And it doesn't only affect human beings, it affects all of creation. This glorious, magnificent, I would say jaw-dropping splendor will be known. That's the glory that is to be revealed to us. I, I don't even know if we can begin to, to grasp it. It's like we have a pair of glasses on, and the best we can do is clean them, but the reality is, is the lenses are all scratched. How, how do you see something clearly when you're looking through, what you're looking through is, is scratched? We won't know until that day when the eye surgeries happen, and we'll be seeing God for who he is. When the lenses are gone, when there's clarity. But we do know that we will see and experience God for who he is. And we will see creation for what it was meant to be. It will be made known. It will be obvious. It will be revealed. To be revealed means it's there, but we just don't see it. A world without sin. No suffering radiating the pure, unveiled glory of God. All available because of God's amazing grace. So what is Paul's conclusion? What is the result of this weigh-in? He's placed the two options on the scale. Suffering of this present time, the glory that is to be revealed to us is the present suffering worth it? Many people you know would say no. It's not. I'm not, I'm not going to follow Jesus. It's, why? There's others that you know who at one point in their life determined to follow Jesus, but then over time have just kind of fallen away, have kind of walked away, and it's no longer a part of their lives. The cost is too much, or they've got other things to do. But as we see from today's verse, Paul's conclusion is absolutely. Without a shadow of a doubt, no hesitation, there is no comparison. The sufferings, the glory, the glory is so incredible and beyond our imagination that this sufferings don't compare. He was settled in his convictions. He had come to conclusion, weighed in the scales of true lasting values, suffering endured in this life are light in comparison to what is to come. And we go... I don't know. You might be going, you may not know what I'm going through. You may not know the suffering I've experienced in my life. The pain, the hurt. Maybe some for following Jesus, maybe some just because of the fall of man. But you don't know. How can you say it is light? It's because we don't know the incredibleness of the glory, the glory that is to come. Paul draws the same conclusion in 2 Corinthians 4, 17 and 18. For this light, momentary affliction is preparing for us an eternal weight of glory beyond all comparison. As we look not to the things that are seen, but to the things that are unseen. For the things that are seen are transient, but the things that are unseen are eternal. Philippians 3, in verse 8, he says, Indeed, I count everything as loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord. For his sake, I have suffered the loss of all things and count them as rubbish in order that I may gain Jesus Christ. On one side is the now. Present sufferings. On the other side is the glory that is to be revealed and I've got to agree that with Paul, as Christians, we have amazing hope. We have a glorious hope. And so we say, well, what does this verse mean for me today? What does it mean as I suffer today? What does it mean as I go through life today? And I think there's four areas of application that I want to just throw out. 
easy to remember, they all start with P. The first is perspective. The perspective from this verse is this. God is in control. We can't let the difficulties of the world stop us from seeing what is to come. Robert Mounts wrote this. If we allow the difficulties of life to absorb our attention, they will effectively blot out the glory that awaits us. You see, we need to remember, we need to remember that what we're going through presently is temporary compared to that which will come, which is eternal. In 2 Corinthians 4 and 18, Paul writes this. He says, As we look not to the things that are seen, but to the things that are unseen. For the things that are seen are transient, but the things that are unseen are eternal. Uh, there's, there's two things I think we need to, to consider about that which will be revealed. And the first is this. As the glory is revealed, suffering will be gone. In Revelation 21 and 4, he says, He will wipe every tear from their eyes, and death shall be no more. Neither shall there be mourning or crying nor pain anymore, for the former things have passed away. But better than the suffering being gone is that when the glory is revealed, we will see God clearly. 1 John 3 and verse 2, it says, Beloved, we are God's children now. What we will be has not yet appeared. But we know that when he appears, we shall be like him because we will see him as he is. I think that verse gives us perspective. The verse also gives us purpose. Because the reality is, is when we go through suffering... It's sometimes hard to see the end. We're going, God, why? God, I don't know if I can I don't know if I can handle this. I think the purpose is, is that God has a plan. And it's twofold. Part of it is for you. Part of it's for you. Because when we suffer and things are beyond anything we can do, I believe it drives us to Christ. John MacArthur writes this, he says, The more we are willing to suffer for Christ's sake on earth, the more we are driven to depend on him rather than our own resources, and the more we are infused with his power. Suffering for Christ draws us closer to Christ. I know in my life it's a reality. And for some of you, that's the same. You've, you've experienced suffering and, and you've got no place to turn. You've got nowhere to go. So you run to Christ. But the second part is this, is it's not just about you. It's about God working through you to the lives of others. 2 Corinthians 1, verses 3 to 5 says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercies and the God of all comfort, who comforts us in our affliction so that we may be able to comfort those who are in any affliction with the comfort that we ourselves are comforted by God. You are a funnel. And the comfort that you had received from God is not meant to stop with you but it is meant after it has done its healing properties in your life to flow into the lives of others so that God can do the same in them because of what he's done in you. I think this verse reminds us of God's purpose because if it didn't, suffering would be difficult and hopeless. This verse also reminds us I believe the third P is promise that God is faithful. Even though we don't understand the suffering we go through, even though we may ask God why, 
even though we may never get the answers. The suffering that we face, we need to remember that God is faithful to his promises. Psalm 23 and verse 6, even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Psalm 46 and verse 1, God is my strength and refuge, a present help in trouble. 2 Corinthians 12 and verse 9, My grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. Therefore, I will boast all the more gladly in my weakness, so that the power of Christ may rest upon me. We can know that the promises of God are true. This verse reminds us to keep perspective, that God has a plan, That he has a promise, but I also believe that it can remind us to be praying for one another. And again, we may not always have the words when someone is suffering, but we can be there. We may not have the answers, and they probably don't want them, but we have the privilege of bringing them before the throne of grace of the God who has created all things. And we can pray that God's presence would be known. They would sense God's peace, that he would sustain them. In Hebrews 13 and verse 3, it says, Remember that those who are in prison, as though in prison with them, and those who are mistreated, since you are all a part of the body, In Colossians 1, verses 9 to 12, Paul wrote, And so from this day that we heard, we have not ceased to pray for you, asking that you would be filled with the knowledge of his will in all spiritual wisdom and understanding, so as to walk in a manner worthy of the Lord, fully pleasing to him, bearing fruit in every good work, and increasing in the knowledge of God, being strengthened with all power, according to his glorious might, for all endurance and patience with joy, giving thanks to the Father who has qualified you to share in the inheritance of the saints in light. Present sufferings of this time, the glory that is to be revealed. Paul says that the suffering of this present time are not worth comparing to that which is to come. May we have perspective. May we know God's purpose. May we sense his promises. And we'll be individuals who will be praying and coming alongside of one another. Let's pray. Father God, I want to thank you for this verse. My heart's sense is that as Paul is writing these words, he knows the struggle that is happening in Rome. He knows the weight of what they are facing. And God, in in the same way, Paul could have written these words to us. Because suffering is real because of the fall. Suffering is real because of following you. But help us to, to, in a small way, get a glimpse through the knot hole to see your incredible glory. So that Paul, we would say, even though what I have faced has been difficult, it is light in comparison to what is to come. And God, we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.